All life consists of cells. We can see cells with a normal light microscope and maybe the nucleus, but the subcellular structures won't really be visible. Using an electron microscope, however, allows us to see far finer details so we can see an image of the organelles. As such, these microscopes have a better resolving power and a higher resolution, we say. We can calculate the actual size of a cell by knowing the magnification of the microscope. Magnification is equal to image size divided by object size. Therefore, rearranging this, we can measure the size of the image, then divide by the magnification, and that gives us the actual cell size. We put them into two main groups. Eukaryotic cells have a nucleus in which their DNA is found. That's your plant and animal cells, for example. Prokaryotic cells don't have a nucleus, and their DNA is found in a ring called a plasmid. Both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells contain similar organelles or subcellular structures. The cell membrane keeps everything inside the cell, but they're also semi-permeable, which means they allow certain substances to pass through. Plant cells and most bacteria have an extra cell wall made of cellulose, providing a rigid structure for them. Cytoplasm is the liquid that makes up the cell in which most chemical reactions take place. Mitochondria is where respiration takes place, releasing energy for the cell to function. Ribosomes are where proteins are assembled or synthesized. Plant cells also contain chloroplasts, which contain chlorophyll, where photosynthesis takes place. Plant cells also contain a permanent vacuole, in which sap is stored. Just for triple, bacteria multiply by binary fission, so the number doubles every, say, 10 minutes. So if we started with one bacterium, after an hour we'd have 2 to the power of 6, that's 64. After 6 hours, that's 36 lots of 10 minutes, so in theory we'd have 2 to the power of 36, that's, in standard form, 6.87 times 10 to the 10. We can do a practical on this by producing a culture on agar in a petri dish using aseptic technique, that is, making sure nothing else contaminates the culture. We lift the lid of the dish towards a flame, which causes other microbes in the air to move away and upwards from the dish, and it destroys them too. Using sterilised equipment, we can either put a drop of bacteria culture in the middle, or spread it all around and put spots of different antibiotics on top instead. We put a few bits of tape around the dish to hold the lid on, but not all the way around, otherwise air will not get in and the bacteria will respire anaerobically. We then incubate it at 25 degrees. Once the culture has grown, we can either calculate the size of the culture from an initial drop or the area in which bacteria did not grow or were killed by an antibiotic to then compare with others. In both cases, we use pi r squared or pi d squared over 4 to calculate the area of the circles. Eukaryotic cell nuclei contain DNA, which is stored in several chromosomes. Humans have 23 pairs of these in every nucleus, so we call them diploid cells. That's not the case for gametes, though. They have half, so just 23, not 23 pairs. So therefore, we call them haploid cells. New cells must constantly be made for growth and repair. They do this by duplicating by mitosis. Here's the process, the mitosis process. The genetic material is duplicated, and the number of ribosomes and mitochondria is doubled as well. The nucleus breaks down, and one set of each chromosome pair is pulled to opposite sides of the cell. A new nucleus forms in each of these to house the copied chromosomes, and we now have two identical cells. By the way, AQA just say the nucleus divides, which isn't quite right, but you will get the mark if you put it. Cells specialise depending on the function they need to fulfil. For example, nerve, muscle, root hair, xylem, phloem cells. Stem cells are those that haven't yet specialised. They're found in human and animal embryos and the meristem of plants. That's the top of the shoot. Stem cells are made in your bone marrow throughout your life as well, but these ones can only specialise into blood cells. We can use stem cells to combat conditions like diabetes and paralysis. In fact, right out of the movie The Island, people are now getting clones of themselves made, then harvesting the stem cells, as these won't be rejected by the patient. Personally, I think this is a dystopian man-made horror beyond comprehension. You have to weigh up the ethical arguments for yourself. Cloning plants can be used to prevent species from becoming extinct, or produce crops with specific characteristics. Diffusion is the movement of molecules or particles from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. We say they move down the concentration gradient. Like a ball just rolling down a hill, it'll do it by itself. This doesn't require any energy input, so we say it's passive. This will happen across a semi-permeable membrane if the holes are large enough for the molecules to move through. For example, water can pass through, but glucose will not, at least not by diffusion anyway. Osmosis is the name specifically given to the diffusion of water across such a membrane. For example, if there is a higher concentration of glucose outside a cell, the glucose cannot diffuse in to balance the concentration, so instead the water moves out of the cell, resulting in a decrease in its mass. 
The rate of diffusion and osmosis can be increased by increasing the difference in concentrations, increasing the temperature, or increasing the surface area. This is why the villi in your small intestine are lumpy, as well as alveoli in your lungs and root hair cells, for example, too. The practical on osmosis goes as follows. Cut equal size cylinders from a potato or other vegetable, weigh them and place in test tubes with varying concentration of sugar solution. After a day or so, we remove them, dab the excess water off their surface and re-weigh. We calculate percentage change in mass by doing final mass take away initial mass divided by the initial mass times 100. If it's lighter than it was before, this must be a negative change in mass. We plot these percentages against sugar concentration and we draw a line of best fit. Where this crosses the x-axis is what concentration should result in no change in mass, so no osmosis, so this means this must be the same as the concentration inside the potato. Glucose and other nutrients and minerals can move through a membrane by active transport, where carrier proteins use energy to move substances through the membrane. As there's energy used, this can actually move them against a concentration gradient, for example, moving mineral ions into plant root hair cells. So I hope you found that helpful. Leave a like if you did and pop any questions or comments below. I'll see you in the next video.